stay watching at the end of this video for news of other junior survivals currently available. What's a rabbit to you? Cuddly, inoffensive, a childhood pet perhaps, like Peter Rabbit or Little Grey Rabbit. Or a resourceful and determined colonizer, described in Richard Adams's book, Watership Down. Perhaps you have a farming background and you see the rabbit as a destructive pest, costing your industry 30 million pounds a year in lost crops. Before rabbits became a pest, they were something of a bonus to the farmer, who could catch them and sell them as meat and skins. Later, because of the damage they did, farmers began to persecute them. And when a dreadful plague nearly wiped out the rabbit population in 1954, most farmers were delighted, but a lot of townspeople were very upset to hear of their favorite wild animals dying a horrid death in the open fields. Although millions of rabbits did die, the population recovered, reprieved, as it were, from the sentence of death. Every year at harvest time, the case comes up for appeal. Let's look at the evidence. Our inquiries begin at the dawn of a new year in a great rabbit city called Wimpole Warren. It's in sloping parkland, an ideal place for rabbits to live. They've been here for over a hundred years. Early morning finds the rabbits innocently making their way home. While the field fair busily looks for his first meal of the day, the rabbits can relax. They've already eaten their fill. Being largely nocturnal animals, they've been feeding all through the night. It helps them to avoid their enemies. At night, the rabbits tend to pick up twigs and dirt in their thick coats. Twigs are not the kind of things to take underground before a good day's sleep. It's a bit like biscuit crumbs in bed. So the rabbits wash meticulously. The most important figure in the landscape is this male rabbit. He's easily recognizable by the black marks above his eyes scars which show that he's recovered from myxomatosis. Surprisingly enough, uh, Black Scar is very aggressive in defending the territory around his burrow. Intruders know where the boundary is because he marks it with a scent gland under his chin. The trials of strength at this time of the year serve to establish Black Scar's dictatorship over all other male rabbits. He feeds quietly, but always moving towards his rival until close enough for attack, and then sends him packing. Having the best feeding grounds in the warren, Black Scar has a distinct advantage over other bucks, and threat is usually enough. But when he catches the scent of his closest rival, the second-ranking male, the fight can get really vicious. While buck rabbits are aggressive on the surface, their family life underground is quite a different story. In a crowded burrow system, there's no room for a lot of fighting. Someone could get hurt. So below ground, rabbits remain on friendly terms. There's a strong bond between a buck and his senior doe. She takes the initiative in choosing a burrow, and he then protects the surrounding feeding grounds for her. Rabbit society is subtly dominated by the does. You might say it's a matriarchy ruled by the females. Smell is important in rabbit society too. Wrinkling her nose isn't the prelude to a sneeze. It exposes more sensitive parts of the nostrils. Back on the surface, Black Scar, too, is sniffing what the wind brings him. He knows all the rabbits in the warren individually by their smell. Uh, just at present, he's looking for his principal mate. When the doe is about to come into breeding condition, she sometimes actually moves towards him 
It's one of the few times she seems to notice her mate's existence. Otherwise, she just tolerates him as the defender of her burrow. From December to June, the doe will become receptive every seven days until she is fertilised. This time, the courtship doesn't come to much and she moves off. To keep other potential suitors away, Scar uses an unusual manoeuvre. It's called enurition. He approaches a subordinate buck and sprays urine on his coat, which is enough to drive anyone underground let alone a subordinate buck. Some buck rabbits live a solitary, nomadic existence for part of the year. They've probably been forced out of an overcrowded warren, and being buck rabbits, they don't dig burrows. They have to live on the surface, anywhere they can find good grass, until the breeding season begins. In January, they often travel for miles in search of a mate. This one is trying his luck in Black Scar's warren. Against the rightful owners, he stands little chance. Perhaps if he's lucky, he might be allowed to stay somewhere near the edge. There, at least, he'll have a burrow to shelter in. At the centre of the warren, Black Scar is courting his doe once more. He adopts a more distant approach and she allows herself to be pursued. Feeding like this in daylight is merely a ritual. The serious feeding is done at night. This time, Scar's advances are better received. Three weeks later, Scar's doe will give birth underground. The warren's a safe place for her young, just because there are so many rabbits around, all on the alert for danger. Unlike rabbits, their relations, the hares, have no such security. They live solitary lives in the open fields, bringing up their young in shallow nests on the ground, called fawns. Hares are among our oldest inhabitants. They've been in Britain for a hundred thousand years. Quite a long time before the rabbits turned up. In fact, we can date the arrival of rabbits to within a few years. They were brought in by the Normans soon after the Battle of Hastings. Kilpeck Church in Herefordshire is one of the finest Norman churches in England. At its east end, the Masons embellished it with almost cartoon-like characters. They show that by the 12th century, the rabbit was well known in England. For 600 years, there was no such thing as a truly wild rabbit. They were kept in warrens under the watchful eye of a warrener, who sold their meat for the pot and their fur to a farrier. The warrener culled a certain number each year and left the rest to carry on the stock. One of the ways of catching rabbits was ferreting, a method that still continues unchanged to this day. The first thing is to cover all the holes and emergency exits with nets, carefully pegged down. Rabbiting these days isn't mainly for food. The rabbits, which the Normans cultivated so carefully, escaped. And in the open, they bred like, well, like rabbits. Now they do an estimated 30 million pounds worth of damage a year to crops and timber. Ferreting is just one way of controlling their numbers. The netting done, a ferret is taken out of its carrying box and introduced into the burrow. This one doesn't seem too keen to stay down. Some ferreters like to work with two ferrets at the same time. Well-established warrens are a maze of twisting passages with up to ten different bolt holes. Escape is easy, both for the rabbit and for the ferret. This is a polecat ferret, or fidget. It's particularly good at driving rabbits to the surface. The thundering of feet inside the burrow indicates that it's succeeded once again, and as the rabbits come out, the rabbiter is there to kill them as quickly and painlessly as possible.
The light-coloured coat and pink eyes of the other animal mean it's an albino, a true ferret. Its scent spells mortal danger to a rabbit. When the scent gets too strong, the rabbits will bolt for the open air and into the catcher's nets. For some rabbits in the warren, there is no cause for concern. Walled up in a side alley of one of the main burrows, these youngsters are isolated from predators and also from their father, Black Scar. Now, that is just as important because, unhappily, he'd eat them if he found them. Keeping their coats clean is the first thing that they learn. These young rabbits, or kittens as they're called, are now a lively three weeks old. The doe has made just one short visit a day to feed them, excavating her way in and then walling them up when she leaves. When they grow up, they'll have to dig their own way to freedom. On a cool April day, the next generation of rabbits is about to have its first glimpse of a new world. This is one of many litters that will emerge during the breeding season. Each year, a doe may have up to six litters of as many as six babies each. 36 hungry mouths for the unfortunate farmer to feed. For the first few days, the family sticks together, but the young soon have to learn to fend for themselves. Their mother mated two days after the birth of the first litter and will soon be preoccupied with her next family. Among the young is one of Black Scar's sons. We'll call him Blaze after the characteristic white blaze on his forehead. He's destined for higher things to come, the rabbit most likely to succeed. Blaze and his brothers mature, life will get tougher in a warren that's daily more crowded. Soon they'll be pushed around by the older bucks, but for the moment there is time to relax. Rabbits eat up to a pound of grass a day. Unlike cows, they don't chew the cud to get the best from it. They digest the food twice by eating their own pellets. If they didn't, they'd have to eat twice as much grass. It's a habit that they share with hares. By June, the warren is teeming with rabbits. Many of the youngsters are living on the surface for lack of burrow space. A rabbit without a burrow is a sitting target for predators. And man isn't the only animal that spells danger in the warren. Rabbits are born with one big disadvantage. They are quite delicious to eat and one of the favourite foods of every carnivorous animal that is big enough to catch them. A rabbit is the biggest animal a buzzard can kill and one that is well worth the effort. During the breeding season, buzzards depend on rabbits to feed their young. While the buzzard is their principal enemy from the air, the rabbit's most famous predator hunts them on foot. In the summer months, foxes don't actually depend on rabbits for their survival, they also enjoy fruit, beetles, game birds and voles, but it takes more of these to get the same amount of protein as they can get from one rabbit. Luckily, this fox isn't hunting. He's probably fed already this morning and is off to take 40 winks. The rabbits seem able to sense this and some of them don't bother to bolt for their holes as he lopes past them. But even underground, there is still one menace that can follow them. It is the stoat an animal that might have been designed specifically to catch rabbits. In fact, stoats get most of their food from the warren. 
In 1954, many stoats starved to death when at least 95% of the rabbits vanished from the English countryside. The rabbits had been killed by a virulent plague introduced from France, a plague called myxomatosis. It's a horrible disease. In the final stages, the rabbits become paralyzed and blind. To begin with, people didn't know what transmitted the disease. They only knew that it occurred mainly in the breeding season. Later, a scientist called R. M. Lockley discovered that what carried the disease was the rabbit flea, which could breed only after feeding on the blood of a pregnant doe. During the spring of 1954, almost every rabbit that was born picked up the fleas and contracted the disease and died. The English landscape changed as a result. The grass grew longer and the corn sprang up as never before. Understandably, the English taste for rabbit pie changed too. This race of crippled creatures was no longer seen as a fit source of food. But the rabbits held on. And although the disease still occurs, their population is now back to a third of pre myxomatosis level. Many of them have become immune to the plague. Others, like these, can recover from it scarred for life, but healthy. Probably the greatest killer today is neither disease nor stoats. It is the English winter. The first rabbits came from Morocco and sunny Spain. For their descendants in Britain, bitter weather is a fearful ordeal. Winter hits hardest on the edge of the warren, where the weaker rabbits don't have burrows to shelter in. They merely dig themselves a shallow scrape and trust to luck that the cold weather won't last too long. Those at the centre of the warren are in a stronger position. They can hole up underground for several days at a time. But burrow or no burrow, if the grass gets covered for too long, all the rabbits will starve. Only about half the rabbits will survive through a hard winter. It's a test of endurance and their ability to make the best of sparse feeding grounds. Only the strongest will be there to greet the thaw. The survivors are often those with the strongest stomachs. A rabbit which depended on grass for its food would starve. When the rabbits can't get all the grass they need, they often have to turn to other foods, and tree bark is one of them. In the springtime, the evidence still remains in the form of stripped branches with pathetic tooth marks. A few strips of bark can be the difference between starvation and mere hunger. These fallen branches aren't a favourite rabbit food, they just show how bad the winter's been. The rabbit really prefers to nip young saplings in the bud. This, and bark stripping, kills hundreds of trees in a hard winter. The Forestry Commission and the rabbit have always had a strained relationship. This tree, blown down by a winter storm, probably fed a good number of starving rabbits. Rabbits cost the farmer a tidy sum too. For him, they've always been pests. Myxomatosis lightened the burden, but not for long. In 1953, rabbit damage cost nearly 50 million pounds. By 1955, the first year after myxomatosis, it was almost nil. Now it's approaching 30 million again. In spring, the damage doesn't look much, just a few blades of wheat gone from the edge of a field. But come harvest time, you can see the result. The rabbits nightly raids from the hedgerows have taken a toll. Without a doubt, rabbits must be controlled. But the question is, how best to do it? For the survivors at Black Scars Warren, the winter is past and the farmers' problems are starting to multiply again. 
Even some of the hardiest individuals have passed on, and that's meant a change in the cast of characters. Black Scar has died, and the dictatorship of the Wimpole Warren is vacant. But not for long. Scar's son, Blaze, now rules the roost. Even after his first autumn moat, he still has his characteristic white mark. As a dictator's son, he found the takeover easy because he already inhabited the central burrow. But he still got to enforce his rule with endless patrols. So the cycle of the generations goes on, as it has here for a hundred years. Winter kills, but spring renews the population. Soon the Warrens as crowded as ever. But even in the best years, it's never really crowded. Rabbits have a form of birth control which prevents that. When the warren's full, or food is in short supply, a pregnant doe can reabsorb the embryos within her, saving her energy to give birth at a more suitable time. While Richard Adams's book Watership Down suggests that rabbit society is patriarchal, that the buck is head of the family, in reality it's the senior doe that's in command. She allows herself to be courted only when it suits her. Having decided where to live, she makes the house or burrow for her children and allows him to defend the territory. He merely obliges her. Whatever we think of such an arrangement, and there are plenty of human societies that live this way, it's enabled the rabbit to take over Britain, perhaps too completely. We have to decide what to do about it. Rabbits in the wild are a sight which makes the English countryside a richer place to enjoy. Even though they're underground for most of our waking hours, when we can see them, rabbits are charming and eminently lovable. If you're a farmer trying to get a good wheat crop from your fields, you may not, however, find their faces so endearing. But even if you are a farmer, rabbits are good to eat. After all, that's why they're in Britain at all. And even though wild rabbits are still out of favour in some places because of myxomatosis, rabbit meat is gradually being accepted again. There seems to be an answer here. Instead of introducing any more plagues to kill rabbits, perhaps we ought to take a lesson from our Norman ancestors. Regularly cropped and humanely killed, rabbits in most of Britain could provide us with good quality meat while we control their numbers. In some agricultural areas, they may have to be eliminated humanely with gas. But elsewhere, by holding back the growth of hedgerows and trimming the grass on the downs, for example, they help to preserve the beauty of the English scene, a scene of which they themselves are a favourite part. So, though rabbits may not be as harmless as they look, there is a lot to be said in their favour. now at other junior survival videos currently available. To some, they're pets. To others, they're pests. But everyone will agree that the grey squirrel is a fascinating mammal. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed is a unique study from both outside and inside the squirrel's nest. Everyone knows what a badger looks like, yet few people actually see wild badgers. As you will see in this video, they're generally harmless creatures, but for centuries they've been persecuted, and all too often we have been ready to blame it on the badger. Today, rabbits are one of our best-known and best-loved mammals, and this video is a fascinating story of the rabbit in the wild. His family life in the burrow is ingeniously filmed from underground as we follow the trail of Peter Rabbit. 
Mrs. Tiggywinkle is the famous hedgehog created in 1905 by Beatrix Potter. But in reality, we rarely get the chance to see these mysterious little creatures, apart, that is, from those unfortunate ones that didn't make it across the road. In our video, The Truth About Mrs. Tiggywinkle, you'll discover not a bumbling ball of prickles, but a lively, eccentric mammal. The ostrich. They're the largest birds in the world, and they can run up to 40 miles per hour. But nature, unfortunately, gave them wings that were never built to fly. Cats come in many shapes and sizes, from the one in your living room to the lions of Africa. What is it about them that endears them to people? What is there about a lion that makes it so noble? Find out in Curiosity and the Cat. He can accelerate up to 40 miles an hour in just two seconds. And with a top speed of over 70 miles per hour, the cheetah is most certainly the fastest thing on four legs. Dolphins. When the trainer says jump, they jump. People flock to dolphinariums to marvel at this animal's ability and power. But few people have been fortunate enough to see these intelligent, lovable animals in the wild and watch them jump for joy. The star of low-level attack is the white-bellied sea eagle. It lives in the Far East along the coastline where it catches fish and sea snakes. With stunning ground-to-air photography, this is one video not to be missed. He's a well-equipped predator with an acute sense of smell and can even detect his prey in total darkness. He's North America's most feared reptile. His name is Rattler. The world of junior survival. Wildlife at its very best on video.